Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Welcome back to The Crunch, Chris Trotter. It's a pleasure to have you back. A pleasure to be here, Cam. So, Chris, uh, I thought I'd give you a call being a doyen of the left. You know, you've started, a f- been involved in the startup of a couple of parties. What on earth is going on inside the Greens? Well, first of all, just the one party, uh, the new Labour Party I was involved with, um, but that's the only one. Um, got the T-shirt somewhere, even got a few rosettes. But the Greens, the Greens, the Greens. Well, I think what we're seeing is either the slow death of the Greens or an opportunity for its most popular um, leader ever, uh, Chloe Swarbrick, uh, to reshape the Greens in a fashion which will enable them to continue to grow as a party and to function as an effective partner for presumably Labour or or any other um, uh, coalition participant. Yeah, it's it's an interesting history the Greens have got, isn't it? They've started off as the Values Party and then sort of morphed into various different guises, ended up being the Green Party as part of the alliance, and then they came out of the alliance and stood on their own two feet. And they've kind of like pegged at it about, you know, every now and then they'll get polls that puts them in the high teens. But when reality, when voting comes, their numbers drop away somewhat in in the final campaign. And I don't know whether that's because they don't have a valid argument or, or, or a, a policy point that's relevant. But for the outsiders of the Greens, it looks like they oppose an awful lot and want to ban a whole lot of things and don't actually propose any sensible solutions that could have any sort of political mileage. Well, it's interesting that you should draw attention to um, their rather negative stance vis-a-vis the rest of the world, because a friend of mine passed on to me some information the other day uh, from the UK, which indicated that objections to development of any sort in the UK, even improvements to local communities featured objections at the local level at least, and sometimes from the national level also, objections from the Greens, the the UK Greens. It seems as though, as you say, uh, the Greens are almost unable to see anything new uh, anything uh, dramatic happening out there in the world <laughs> without them wanting to stand in the way, which makes them, in reality, a, a very conservative party uh, in some respects. Conservative, I suppose, you know, with the small c and related also, of course, to the word conservation, which you would, I suppose, expect. Um, And this may just be a feature of the UK where you have what is known there as the Green Welly Brigade, and these are conservative with capital C um, environmentalists, one of whom um, was, believe it or not, Margaret Thatcher. So it may just be a peculiarity of the British uh, Green movement. But getting back to New Zealand, I think um, you mentioned values as being the the original um, political impulse in New Zealand. I think that's certainly true, and certainly it was one of the first, if not the first, um, post-scarcity political movements in the world. But, you know, if you look at the history of values, you see in many ways a prefigurement of what is now happening in the Greens. Mm. Because what happened in Values was there was a guy called uh, John Stewart, and he was based in Christchurch, and he was an old-fashioned socialist, but he understood um, the importance of conservation um, in an industrial world. And he was very involved um, with the Greens, and he was a classic old-school grassroots organiser. 
Uh, and he built values into uh, what by 1978, uh, that would have been the third election they contested, was a pretty staunch um, left-wing party. Eco-socialist, I think, would be a fair description of it. Yeah. And the level of support for the for the for the values party dropped quite precipitously um, in nineteen seventy two it started and it did very well given that New Zealand was a pretty rigorous two party system at the time but in nineteen seventy five when Rob Muldoon romped to victory. Um, they did very well. They got over 5% of the vote, which in a two-party system is pretty good. Although in New Zealand, we had social credit, which complicated matters tremendously. So let's just not go there. That's a whole other program. But in 78, they dropped away, and that precipitated a real fight uh, between what you might think as being the classical Greens, classical values, all about the environment and no economic growth and you know the perils of modernity, blah, 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 blah. And John Stewart um, and Tony Konofsky and his socialist wing, and the socialists lost. But the victory of the environmentalists did not help because values um, sank away further and further until it kind of blipped off the screen and was reborn in 1989-90 as the Greens. Yeah. And I remember people in ACT telling me, God, I wish we were like the Greens. I don't know how they did it. They covered virtually every single interest group within their electoral um, uh, support, right? And I don't know whether it was by um, accident or design either, but ACT was right. If you looked at the people who went into Parliament um, in, what was it, 1999, they did cover all of the bases. I mean, you had Jeanette Fitzsimons, the classic conservationist and environmentalist. You had... Dear departed Rod, uh, Rod Donald, um, who had the you know the trade aid, and he had been involved in the whole MMP thing, and then you had the two Reds, you had uh, Sue Bradford and the late Keith Locke, um, yep, and then you had um, uh, I think it was Sue Kedgley, who was all about the food we put into our bodies and blah 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 blah, and it was just like perfect the the, the seven representatives they got by just and only just cresting the 5% threshold really mirrored the the, the political coalition um, of uh, green and inverted commas or environmentalist or eco-socialist or whatever you want to call them, you know, because it is a, it's a fairly wide tent, the green movement, but they, they had covered all the bases and it made them extremely effective. But they were all um, very reasonable people. I mean, Sue Kedgley was a reasonable person. I remember joking with her yeah. in her office um, when she was banging on about public transport, and I had a meeting with her in her office. And I said to her, well, well, you're a big advocate for public transport, Sue, but what, what do you, how do you get to Parliament? She says, oh, I drive, of course. <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they, they all were. And, and among the most radical of them all, Sue Bradford, you know, she turned out to be a very, very effective uh, worker on both sides of the aisle, as they would say um, in the United States. Was her, um, was her um, reaching across the aisle that passed the anti-smacking bill? Not that it was that's right. effective, but it was still a cross-party um, solution that was yep. that was sought there by Sue Bradford. Yep. So they were a very effective bunch, but. But, and there's always a but, um, they were also, I think, a sitting duck for identity politics. And the reason why they were a sitting duck for identity politics is because of the way they make decisions. Yeah. Now, they are a consensus-based decision-making party, although, you know, I... I, I never really buy into that. 
I prefer to call them a party where the minority rules, <laughs> right? And, uh, well, and, and because that's effectively what you've got. And in the early days, and this was a hangover from the Values Party as well, in the early days, they didn't so much have leaders as they had a sort of philosopher kings and queens. I mean, Jeanette really, you know, fitted that description rather well, I thought. They had these sort of serene people whose wisdom was quite obvious to all, and there was a tightly knit group around them. And really, if anything was going to get done or undone, it would be this group that did it. And they did it sometimes publicly, sometimes behind the scenes. Generally speaking, the decisions they made were fairly sound ones, but they weren't made democratically. They were very suspicious of majoritarian politics. They tended to believe that if you were able to assemble a majority, you were probably a demagogue, and that was a very bad thing indeed. And it was better to let wise people rule almost invisibly, and that was pretty much the way things went kind of uh, in the green. It's journalistic, isn't it? You know, well, the camp yeah, well, the camp I mean, it, other it, thing, giving you a big hug, and this is what's best for you, and we're going to do this now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of that. I mean, in addition to the Morris dancing, you know, I, I attended a few of these when they would let people attend. Um, you've got to really scratch your head. The Greens, who who present themselves as, as the new way, as the open, the transparent, the accountable new way of politics, nothing these but. days, yeah. if you're a journalist, you cannot get into their meetings. I mean, it's bad enough with Labour and National these days, but you can at least sort of, you know, hover around, they give you a media pass, you can sit in on the plenary sessions anyway. Um, but the Greens, it's just like a, a brick wall. Um, they'll come out and the leaders will sort of deliver a set speech so that there's something to put on the six o'clock news. But the idea that you, as a journalist, can go in and watch proceedings of this this party, which, which is seeking to become the government of the country or part of the government of the country, so they kind of are obliged to let people look, you know. Um, yeah. No, no, you can't get in. But... The problem with that consensus-based decision-making, it's fine when the only people playing the game are Jeanette and Doug, her, her, her husband, and, and all these other wise old heads, many of whom were in the Values Party. That's fine. But what if people come in who go, ah, oh, so 25% plus one can stop anything from happening? Hmm, this is interesting. So if we... You know, who knows who we are? I mean, Maori, Pacifica, LGBTQ, plus, plus, plus. Um, if we join the Greens and we dig our toes in, then we can pretty much force the party to tick off all the items on our agenda. Now, in the case of Maori, that was made easier by the fact that among the wise old heads, supposedly, were people like Catherine Delahunty, who had been tireless um, uh, propagandists, mm. is probably the correct term, on behalf of a particular interpretation of um, the Treaty of Waitangi and, and the obligations it supposedly imposed upon the um, colonial people, the Pākehā, whatever. Um, she had been tireless in her um, advocacy for this particular view of the treaty. If you didn't share that view of the treaty, by the way, you simply couldn't get on the candidate list. Mad I mean, there were... I was swaying, didn't she? Yeah, I mean, she did. And eventually she got into Parliament as well. But the point is that from the moment the Greens got going, that whole treatyism, as some people call it, was absolutely part and parcel of where they were going. And if, if you were someone who had a good track record in conservation, but you were a wee bit iffy about that particular interpretation of the treaty, well, forget about it. You yeah. weren't going to get on the list. 
So perhaps you could make a, a, a slight special case for the treaty and and Maori issues within the Greens because they were there from the beginning. But the other identity groups which came in were able to use and are still using, as far as I'm aware, the provisions of their constitution in a way which probably wasn't envisaged by the philosopher kings and queens, shall we say. Uh, And we saw this most vividly in relation um, to James Shaw. Yeah. There was no one opposing James Shaw. No, but... Right, when he stood for re-election as co-leader. But 25% plus one voted to open nominations again. And the crazy rules of the Greens meant that even though 74% of the people who were in the room to decide wanted James to be um, re-elected as the co-leader, um, they had to open the whole process again uh, and make the Greens look incredibly stupid because, as I say, it's a party where the minority rules, not the majority. And until that changes... Uh, the Greens are constantly going to be at the mercy of minorities. I'll give you an example of just how nuts this gets, right? They have in the Greens now what they call lived experience groups. Right. Lived experience, right? Now, this is all part and parcel of identity politics and intersectionalism and critical uh, race theory and, you know, the whole nine yards of um, extreme left-wing thought in this strange age we live in. Um, The idea is that lived experience trumps everything else, right? Right. We're not interested in the views of so-called experts. They're probably white anyway, and it's probably Western expertise, which, of course, is wrong. Um, So what we will um, promote above all else is the lived experience of our members. Now, you know, there's a certain attraction to that. You know, if you see academics up at the podium going blah, 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 and then someone steps forward and says, yeah, actually, but I worked at a factory for 30 years, and I know that that's just bullshit. See, in those kind of situations, you think, yeah, fair enough, you know, because what does the professor know when you've got someone who was actually there? And there is certainly, you know, a place for the corrective um, that lived experience provides, especially when, you know, you've been lectured to by people who really have very little in the way of life experience. It, it um, so but, for the approved groups, because if you're a business person, then your lived experience <laughs> counts against you. <laughs> If you, you lived experience, absolutely. <laughs> yes, the, yes, you're quite right. It, it's only a certain kind of lived experience. Um, yes, yes. Go to the top of the class, comrade. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's very true. But you can imagine the kind of lived experience that counts in the greens, mm. and this is the problem that Chloe Sprawbrook is now facing. Yeah, She has made several speeches um, over the last uh, few months where she talks about building the Greens into uh, a vast and unstoppable popular movement, right? I mean, most recently at her AGM, she talked about building the largest Green Party in the world. Lucky Daryl Kerrigan's now, new party, because he'd tell her she's dreaming. Well... Yeah, I mean, people have been saying that you can build this great mass movement mostly out of the missing million people who don't vote in elections. But even if there were a million people available out there who haven't voted, the structure, the constitutional arrangements that we've just been discussing of the Greens would make it impossible to build such a movement. Because if you've got a mass movement, 
First of all, you can't have consensus-based decision-making, not in a mass movement. I remember, and you you would remember, in, in its heyday, the National Party Conference would have, what, seven, eight, nine hundred delegates present? Oh, even more sometimes I can the next year would be even more. Yeah. We also had 100,000. Yeah, I, I, I can remember the, the Victory Conference of the Labour Party in 1984, where it was held, I think, in the Michael Fowler Centre, and the delegates were up in the mezzanine floor as well as on the ground floor. Um, and I'd never seen that before. I mean, it, it was it was a huge conference. Now, trying to get a, a, a consensus uh, in, in a large and vital political movement. I mean, you can get consensus in North Korea. You know, you, you could get consensus um, at the uh, at the level of the whatever they called it in the Soviet Union mm. um, but that's not that's not the consensus I, I think the greens have in mind although you can never be sure um, but if you've got a, a living breathing democratic party and it's mass based then the only practical way of making decisions is to have open debate and then put it to an effing vote. And if 51% votes in favour, then that's the policy. And you can proceed. 49% might be pissed off, but them's the brakes next time. That's the way it's supposed to work. But the Greens cannot do that. The first rule of politics, learn how to count. Absolutely. 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 Um, but, uh, but you see, in the Greens, if you if you started to get hundreds and then thousands of people signing up, what would you say to them when they came to a meeting? And you know, a whole lot of people start up and reckon, oh, I reckon we should do this, or I think we should do that. And they they got a lot a lot of cheers and big rounds of applause, and some of let's put it to a vote. And then the Greens would stand up and say, oh, we don't do votes. And you can imagine everyone looking around going, you don't do votes. Right. Huh. Would they come back? You know, <laughs> would, would they bother to come back? Or would they go home and tell their friends, you know, I went to a Green meeting the other day and someone suggested, you know, this, that or the other. And everyone was in, in agreement and, and someone um, moved that it become the policy. And they said, we don't do votes in the Greens. Yeah. You just can't imagine, you know, even if there was this huge impulse, even if Toby went out there and persuaded people you know, on the stump that you had to come and join the Greens, the moment they came and joined the Greens, <laughs> they'd be told, well, no, you, you have no ability in this party to have, have your will <laughs> enforced, uh, or not easily anyway. You know? Well, that, that then, with that explanation of how they come to decisions, it, it's no surprise then that they've got all these dud candidates and dud MPs that then fall apart at the drop of a hat because there's there's no sort of Jason Ead type person in the party who digs into their background and finds every murky dirt that they can find uh, or someone like you know Heather Simpson that vetted all the candidates to make sure that there's not going to be any surprises here. They've got nobody who does that, and they've got these little vested interests and you know, identitarian groups, um, you know, splintering right across the whole Green Party, meaning that all of these, you know, actually plonkers end up in Parliament or people with deep personal flaws. I mean, all MPs have got deep personal flaws, but the Greens are in, have got very deep personal flaws in many respects. So you end up with oh, yeah. Gammons, you, you're Elizabeth Carey Carey, um, you, you know, and now you've got, um, you, I mean, that you had Materia Toure, who, who was, you know, a benefit fraudster, uh, and then you've got um, Darlene Tana now, who's uh, by all accounts... Uh, reportedly uh, been exploiting workers in the Green Party, the most socialist party we've got. Now, your credentials aren't going to be that flashed in, are you? And and well, they've got this problem that, that's, with the yeah, lead that, also that, that, who are being radical activists who are having to make decisions all of a sudden that they're not used to making decisions, you end up with a disaster. Yeah. 
Well, no, that's it in a, in a nutshell, Cam. Um, and once again, we go back to the beginning where you had these wise men and women and the tight little circle around, you know, the, the mothers and fathers or parents of the movement. And the list of candidates, A, wasn't long because getting 5 or 6% was considered a good result. So you only actually had to have, you know, yes. seven or eight names. Right. And that was fine because everybody knew everybody. They'd all grown up on the left. They'd all been on the same protest marches. Um, they knew each other, and that was fine. But, see, when you get to be a slightly bigger party and you actually have to have a list that's like 13 or 14 uh, names long, well, then, as you say, you've got to do the vetting. I mean, the, the, the reports have um, uh, Darlene Tana been encountered by someone from the Green Party at Waitangi uh, getting to know one another, and um, it, you know the, the the Green Party person saying, "Gosh, you should stand for the Greens," and coming back and saying, oh, "I met this great person; she'd be a really good candidate," um, and ending up on a list, um, and ending up in Parliament. You know that's that's not the way grown ups behave in politics, you know. That's the way student politicians behave. <laughs> and they've paid the price for that kind of slipshod, ticks all the boxes way of of thinking. It's just been disastrous for them, really. Well, when you when you look back at all the people who have, you know, um, blotted the Greens copybook. I mean in the early days they were amazing. I mean, not only were there no scandals, right, but in Parliament, their conduct was exemplary. They never bad-mouthed anybody. They never insulted people um, in, the in, in other parts of the chamber. Um, they, they stood up and they delivered their ideas as, as well as they could. And they, they, they really did kind of model, you know, um, what was it that Rod Donald used to say? The Greens um, are not of the left. The Greens are not of the right. The Greens are in front. Right? I mean, that was the slogan. I mean, and and to some extent, those those particular Green MPs, the ones who first arrived, 1999, they 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 practiced what they preached. And that's always a really, really um, good um, strategy um, <laughs> in politics. The less you practice what you preach, the less success you tend to have. Yeah, it's interesting you, you mentioned this lived experience. And, and I wonder if the lived experience, uh, you know, rationale is the cause of their candidates falling apart. So let, let's look at Golriz Garriman, right? She's got a dodgy CV uh, where she claimed that she was, you know, um, this human rights lawyer, but in actual fact she was, you know... Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was on the defence team for the mass murder. Yes, I know. <laughs> a bit embarrassing. So, and then you've got her... Not, not that every accused person does not deserve a good defence, but it wasn't quite the impression she gave, was it? And, and then you've got uh, her fanciful story a bit about being a refugee, which, if you talk to her mother, um, is a quite a different story. Uh, and, uh, you know, saying that she was living in war-torn Iran when she was actually living in Mashdod, some 900 kilometres yeah. from... Yeah, from where the, the bullets are flying, yeah. Um, but her lived experience was that she was a person of colour, uh, and a refugee, and and a human rights lawyer, and so she ticked a number of boxes. So yes, you can go on the list. So this lived experience thing is actually hamstringing them and setting them up for failure. Yes, yes, and it's not entirely um, 
uh, a weakness of the Greens either. I think Labour itself is now suffering from its determination to get gender balance and and uh, tick a whole lot of other boxes. Um, because, as you know full well, having grown up in a very political family, um, Cam, you know, it's, it's a really rough and tumble world. And to succeed, you know, it requires, uh, as Liam Neeson would say, a particular set of skills. And they're not that easy to find. And when you find someone that possesses them, you should grab them with both hands. And it shouldn't really matter whether they're male or female or black or white or gay or straight. You should just get them because they're good at it, because they're effective at it. And, you know, this is more and more what is not happening. Uh, and our politics is not the better for it. Well, I wrote an article a couple of days ago then described the Greens' problems as, a, as an issue of political entropy. So if you understand physics, the second law of thermo... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everything tends, tends towards chaos. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> Very <spontaneous> good. <laughs> in a closed system, which you've described, a closed system of the Greens with no external um, observers like media, for example, and then proceeds in a direction that increases randomness or disorder or... As the famous poets Yeats said, things fall apart. And that, that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at a closed system, the Greens, that's got lots of little parts in it that have grown and grown and grown and generated heat. And it's now collapsing in on itself. But every party has this. It's how they deal with it. And I'm not sure the Greens are equipped to deal with it. I mean, Labour had a case of entropy, um, you know, uh, uh, after... Um, they won, you know, in 1984. By 1990, it was all over. You know, just six years, it all collapsed mm -hmm. itself. And you, you were part, part and parcel of helping yeah. them bundle them out the door, um, you know, with the new neighbor. But you end up, then you end up with a case where you've got the Monty Python-esque situation where these splinter parties then set up and they're all splitters, <laughs> you know. And then they go through their growth and then end up dying and withering in the political furnace. And and I'm sitting here bemused thinking this Chloe Swarbrook, who everyone in the media and the left talks up as being this absolute genius, this wonderful person who came third. I mean, anyone else who comes third, it's second loser in, in you know, in the real world, but she was held up as coming third in the Auckland mayoralty and therefore she can lead the Green Party. Well, that's just bollocks. Reality's about to smack her in the bum, and I don't think she realises that. Yeah, to her credit, however, I mean, we've got to, we've got to give credit where it's due. She won Auckland Central twice. That's not easy to do um, uh, at the best of times. Um, but uh, it's particularly hard to do when the party that you're representing... Um, is only you know polling as you say uh, on a good day in in the upper teens, uh, and yeah, I, I mean I take my hat off uh, to her for not just winning Auckland Central once, but holding holding Auckland Central. I uh, I thought I thought that showed. Uh, a bit of grit on her part, although her um, her acceptance speech on the night was a little bit strange. Um, and so, yeah, and also, like, you know, we see it in the polls. I don't think the Greens have ever had a leader that's, what, polling 5 6% for the preferred prime minister. I mean, she's got something. She's got some of those political instincts. But... Honestly, you know, she's in the wrong party. Um, both Labour and the Greens were desperately keen to get their hands on her um, after her showing, um, you know, in the mayoral election. 
And I tend to agree with you. I mean, coming third is like, okay, uh, that's pretty good. Um, but, you know, it's not first and it's not even second. Um, and she wasn't even close. But the uh, point is, there was a real bidding war um, for Chloe Swarbrick, which the Greens somehow won. But I think, uh, you know, when she's uh, no longer um, young and fit and hale and hearty and you know, declining into her dotage, she will she will look back. Um, and she may say to herself, I should have joined Labour. Because the thing is, it's a tougher fight to get to the top of Labour. But the thing is, once you get there, your chances of actually doing something um, are pretty high. Um, and uh, I just think, you know, this urge she has to be a kind of left-wing firebrand and lead the masses um, to revolution. As I as I um, explained earlier, just, you, you can't do this in the Greens. It's not that sort of party, you know. The sort of party that changes things is, is you know, the party of, of Michael Joseph Savage, which was a fiery, disputatious, large um, organisation, the largest in the country, um, which National, when it was formed after the first Labour government came to power, consciously modelled itself on. I mean, the people who formed National said, hey, we must be a mass party. We cannot be a Carter party because that's not how you win in this country. And so they modelled the whole of National's constitution essentially on, on, on Labour's. You know, it had a regional structure, it had a national structure, it had a democratic structure. It was always more democratic than Labour um, because it didn't contain the union bloc. Um, and they chose their own candidates and they had a hand in writing policy. A very different party was formed in 1936 and called National than the party that emerged from the tender ministrations of um, Stephen, oh, what was his last name? Minister of Everything? Stephen Joyce. Joyce, yeah. He turned it into a corporation. Mm. And any, any political party that is a corporation is a corpse. Well, there's no, there's no life to it. In the National Party's no. life. I mean, I can remember when they decided as a corporation they were going to issue a membership card that was going to give you privileges. And yeah. the only privilege that you got from that membership card if you lived in frosty areas was that you had a useful plastic device to scrape ice off your windscreen. <laughs> well, yes, yes. I remember when um, one of the unions I used to work for um, uh, started um, started touting what they called um, with less than marketing finesse the death benefit scheme <laughs> um, and I thought yeah nah <laughs> uh, this this sounds um, really alarmingly um, like the pension scheme of the Teamsters <laughs> which, which you know very soon became um, uh, the uh, the dipping bowl of of the mafia, but you know it, that's not what you have unions for. They're not to give you, you know, um, a, a card and and a and a funeral program. Um, actually, to improve your wages and conditions. But anyway, I digress. The um, the Greens sort of have this. I mean, they're, they're deeply deeply left wing. Um, and it's almost like they've forgotten history. Um, they have this Politburo um, sort of mentality, um, you, you, you know, that's that's graduated from a benevolent sort of motherhood of Jeanette Fitzsimons to uh, the radical feminist uh, Maori activist and woke, um, you know, goddess uh, leading the party. But they seem there's still a Politburo there. 
And they seem to forget that most of the members of, you know, the original Politburo disappeared. <laughs> yes, you're, you're talking about the real one. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I, yes it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't pay to be an old Bolshevik um, under Stalin. Um, it, 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 was, yeah. Yeah, it was Lenin, Trotsky, you know, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Stalin, Sokolov. Karen, yeah, and, all of them. Yeah. And none of them exist. I mean, Lenin and Trotsky disappeared, and only Lenin and Stalin survived all of that, and Stalin survived the most. <laughs> you know? And so yeah, well, of course, they're, they're you know, looking- Trotsky met his end at the uh, at the point of an ice pack in Mexico City in, in 1940 um, at the hands of one of Stalin's uh, um, assassins. So, yeah, Stalin got everybody in the end. Bukharin, who was known as the darling of the party, um, he confessed to all kinds of crimes and, uh, and was uh, executed. Uh, Litvinov, who got the most votes, a terrible thing to do when your other um, candidates include um, Joseph Stalin. He ended up getting shot in a corridor. Um, Yeah, the show trials went on. Yeah, yeah. Revolutions eat themselves. Always have, always will. That's ultimately, and it's probably a good final point here, that the Green Party have become a party of revolutionaries. The things they talk about are revolutionary. Uh, you know, Absolutely. Uh, and and you know they've also got political entropy happening, and all that leads to chaos. Um, which you know the mothers uh, or the female voters of the leafy suburbs of Auckland, which keep the Greens afloat, will start looking with and a little Wellington and Christchurch and Dunedin. Yep, it's one of the one one of the most delightful ironies of the whole Green um, history is that. While they speak for all of the groups that you mentioned, um, you know, Maori, Pacifica, trans, gay, you name it, um, their solid vote, the vote that keeps them in Parliament, um, uh, as Richard Harmon, veteran journalist Richard Harmon said, are the wives of the doctors and architects and, and and professionals of the leafy suburbs of New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for that little uh, history lesson of the, of the Greens. It helps uh, me. It certainly will help the listeners understand the problems that are besetting them at the moment. And, I'm, you know, I'm not sure you can come up with a solution for them or I can come up with a solution for them. Um, it's just going to be entertaining to watch, as from my perspective anyway. Yes, well, that's what we political commentators do, Cam. And, you know, one thing you can say about our profession is that it is never, ever short of entertainment and um, issues to write about. Absolutely. Chris Trotter, thank you for coming on The Crunch. My pleasure, Ken. My pleasure. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email.